Hey guys, Ubersweet here, and welcome to my full guide for Veteran Dreadset Reef. This will be a quick guide, so I won't go through all the details, but it should be enough to get you through the trial. First, I'll go over the ads you'll encounter in the trash packs leading up to the first boss. Here you'll see the Keel Cutter. The Keel Cutter is the ad that does the cone ability here, and will later do a large circle that causes a lot of AoE damage to the group. If you're unable to kill the Keel Cutter quickly, you should get out of the large circle, as it will most likely kill any DPS left in it. This ad is typically a priority throughout the trial. Next we have Swashbucklers. These will jump on the player that's furthest from the group, and will be taunt immune for 6 seconds after jumping. Next we have the Serpent Collar, which summons a Dragon Totem that does a Konal AoE that deals very heavy damage. They also provide Frost Armor to any enemies standing inside their AoEs. And finally we have the rangers. These will place four line AoEs on random players. Anyone targeted should stand still and block. After the ability hits, AoEs will be placed under the players. Now let's take a look at the first boss, Lylanar and Turlisil. There are two orbs in the room, one fire and one ice. These can be activated from anywhere in the room to give the players a dome about 20 meters in diameter. A dome of the opposite type should be held over the boss at all times, and any adds should be taunted in under the dome so that they take more damage. If two domes touch, they explode and disappear while doing heavy AoE damage. Any player holding the dome take one stack per second of damage. Domes should be switched around 20 stacks. There is a 15 second cooldown on taking up a dome. The dome must be over the boss to interrupt the channel attack done throughout the fight. Domes affect enemies under them, but not players. So, jumping into the first phase. After killing the initial adds, one of the bosses will jump down at random. Healers should handle the domes during this phase. Astronauts will spawn at 80% and 75% boss health. It's important to prioritize the astronauts before the boss reaches 65%, as this will start the teleport phase. During the teleport phase, the boss will summon four orbs around the room. The boss will then proceed to jump to these in the same order that they were spawned. The room is typically divided up into four quadrants with two DPS at each orb, taking the dome and interrupting the boss as he jumps to each orb. Once this is done, the first boss will jump up, and the other boss will come down, repeating the first phase again. Once the second boss has finished the teleport phase, we'll begin the final phase. Both bosses will be down and the group splits into two, with each boss next to its opposite orb. A healer and a DPS will swap one dome on each side. Throughout the final phase, one random player will get Frostbrand and another player will get Firebrand. The two players who see this AoE under their feet should move to the center of the room and stack while blocked. Both bosses should be killed at almost the same time. Once one boss is dead, it will no longer be possible to grab a new dome of the opposite type. Eventually, the remaining boss will begin to teleport phase again, which typically results in a wipe, as the boss can't be interrupted. Now some more specifics for the tanks and healers. The Atronauts are typically placed behind the group opposite of the boss under the dome. Tanks should never roll dodge heavy attacks from the boss or Atronauts as this will cause them to enrage. The boss will place an AoE under the tank which should be placed around the edge of the dome while quickly moving out of the area. Tanks will receive a fragility debuff which can be seen as an orb of fire or ice around the tank's torso. The tanks should swap when this debuff is received as it activates after 10 seconds. Tanks will also receive a negate healing debuff, which will require the healers to focus heal the tank to full health. Shield charge or a similar ability can be used to move quickly between the two sides when taunt swapping in the last phase. After the first boss, we'll have a new add called Dreadsail Brewmaster. This add throws potions on the grounds, which can shrink players, making them take more damage and do less damage. They will also buff other enemies and they can heal. These ads should not be the new priority over keel cutters. Now we're going over to the mini boss on the left side called Bowbreaker. This mini boss is basically a large Hajmota. Basically the tank should always face the boss away from the group and the group should always try to stack on the tail of the boss. The off tank should taunt all the adds and bring them to the group so that the group can cleave down the adds. Most groups that wipe on this boss do so because of the flowers that do the poison. 
once players start reaching five stacks, it becomes very hard to survive even with a healer. So it's important that players avoid AoEs and try to move out of poison. Next, we have the right mini boss called Sail Ripper. This boss will place an AoE on a random player. It can even affect a tank. That player needs to go to a larger circle with a hole in it or a donut in order to clear the circle. The donut will stay even if the player dies. The boss can't be moved. So the tank will usually face the boss outwards towards the middle while the DPS stand under the roof to clear any lightning stacks. When the boss jumps, it also needs to be interrupted, otherwise it does AoE damage to the entire group. Next, we have the second boss, Reef Guardian. The Reef Guardian will split into smaller copies of itself. In total, you'll have to deal with the large version you start with, two medium and two small copies. After some time, the Guardians will walk over to one of the smaller holes at the outside edge of the room and become immune. You will notice that there are six small holes placed around the room, each with a different symbol. There is also a large hole in the middle. When a Guardian becomes immune, a DPS or two will need to jump down in the large hole in the middle and find their way to the Reef Heart directly underneath the Guardian. As you jump down as a DPS, you'll see three Whirlpools, which you can synergize with to take you in the right direction. You can also look for the symbol, which is glowing next to the entrance where a channeling Guardian is. Each path covers two of the smaller holes, and you may need to continue in to get to the Reef Heart, which you'll need to destroy. You have 60 seconds to destroy a Reef Heart, which has a total of 776k health. If you fail to destroy the Reef Heart in time, the ceiling will collapse and the entire group will wipe. The Crab does not need to be killed, but you need to avoid the Cone from the Heart and the Crab's attack. A self-heal is recommended. Once done, a player can use the Synergy to get back up again. The player will be infected with a Parasite for 45 seconds. Trying to go down with the Parasite will instantly kill the player. The Reef Guardian will typically go to channel by the closest hole, so keeping the boss next to the hole with the crown in the beginning seems to be optimal. Having three groups for the Reefs is usually enough to give players time to clear the Parasite. With practice, most DPS should be able to solo a Reef Heart, but if you are new to the fight, I recommend setting two players per Reef. That's the main mechanic of the fight covered. Each Guardian has an Acid Cone ability, which will lay down poison puddles under anyone in the cone. It is important that tanks keep the cone away from the DPS while moving out of the AoE on the ground. Staying in the AoE will give Acid Reflux stacks, which increases the amount of damage taken from the Acid Cone. Stacks last for 5 seconds, but refresh when a new stack is received. It is therefore good to avoid having too many Reef Guardians up and to split them between the tanks. When a Reef Guardian is channeling, the entire group will get hit by lightning bolts and will take stacking damage. It is recommended to clear these at 7 stacks. Tanks to try to clear before 15 stacks. There will be a line of lightning indicating the areas which can be used for cleansing. The cleansing areas have poison stacks and I would recommend to quickly go in to clear lightning stacks and then back out again. Do not let the group stand in the poison area as the flowers will spawn increasing amounts of poison. The Reef Guardian will spawn the first Medium Guardian at 80%. Groups tend to either move the largest Reef Guardian away while killing the Medium and Small copies before doing damage to the Large Guardian again. This is to always have a maximum of 3 Guardians. If the group has high enough DPS, you may be able to keep all the Guardians stack and kill a few of them before they move to their channel ability. In the next area, we'll encounter another new ad called the Overseer. The Overseer will stun the tank and then do a knockback which can't be blocked. This means tanks should always have their back towards the wall, otherwise they might end up falling off the platforms. Finally, we're at the last boss, Tideborn Teleria. When fighting the boss, the group will stand on this circle in the middle of the room. I highly recommend using the challenge banner as a reference when positioning, as this is where the whirlwinds during the winter storm will spawn. The main tank should be positioned to the right or left just enough so that the boss cleave does not hit the group. The water outside the ring has slaughterfish, and the water under Tideborn Teleria will cause you to take high amounts of ticking damage. During the fight, a behemoth will spawn every 60 seconds. He should be either cleaved or focused down by the DPS. His AoE ability will instantly kill anyone hit by it and leaves a circle on the ground which goes away when the behemoth dies. At around 75%, the boss will start spawning sirens. These are placed at the outside edge of the ring and are typically killed as the group runs around the circle during the winter storm. They have an ability called Lure of the Sea, which will cause players to walk into the water in the middle and die if they can't break free. 
Your group doesn't need a lot of damage to kill this boss, but the behemoth and sirens serve as a DPS check of sorts. If you're not able to kill the behemoths in 60 seconds, and if you can't kill at least a few of the sirens, you'll start getting more and more behemoths and sirens, which will make the fight much more difficult. Throughout the fight, five players will receive rapid deluge, which kind of looks like white bubbles coming off of the player. If the main tank has taunt on the boss, they cannot receive this. Players need to either spread out or go into the water to mitigate this AoE, which does around 20k damage in a 19 meter radius after 6 seconds. Going into the water will cancel the AoE completely. Every 20 seconds or so, the boss will spin its blades for 6 seconds. Do not try to block this damage, this goes for DPS, tanks, and healers. If you block during this phase, you'll lose all your stamina, and you'll die to some other mechanics like sirens that will pull you into the water. The group should stack together with the healers while they spam Comet Prayer, and make sure to have their heal over times active. Barrier can be used to help mitigate the damage here, but most groups shouldn't need it. The main tank can come into the group for a short time to get some heals and synergies while this is happening. During Crashing Wave, the boss will do three linear AoEs with an additional AoE on the main tank. These AoEs can either be roll dodged, or you can simply move out of them before they trigger. After 85%, Winter Storm will begin to spawn, and it always spawns at the challenge banner, and then goes in a random direction. If the storm goes right, the tank should try to pass through the whirlwinds in the first 3 seconds. The tank would then follow the whirlwinds, and the group follows the tank around in a first circles to the challenge banner. The storm goes 665 degrees around, or almost 2 laps, and will end 45 degrees from the challenge banner. In addition to all these mechanics, there will also be bridges that spawn at 50%, 35%, and 20%. They will cancel any winter storm when they are spawned. I recommend sending 2-3 to three DPS to do each bridge in two separate groups in case another bridge spawns while the first group is still doing the first bridge. When the bridge spawns, you'll see rocks fall in the water, leading out to one of the sections on the side. The DPS will need to run on these rocks in order to get to one of the mages. You'll need to bring the mage down to 50%, which is about 1.75 million damage in less than 60 seconds. After this, the mage will go through a portal, which the DPS should also take, and spawn on the land. The off tank should bring the mage to the group to kill the mage in the same way that behemoths are handled. Now, to discuss some strategies as bridge skips are possible, if you've read uh, Nelandia's guide to VDSR, it mentions that 841k group DPS is required for skipping all three bridges, but from my experience, the needed DPS is closer to 680k group DPS, or 85k per DPS. Also note that the DPS only needs to be maintained during the last 70 seconds of the fight. The reason for this is the first bridge takes a few seconds to spawn before the 60 second timer starts. It also takes around 8 seconds for the mage to walk through their portal and cast their ability which wipes the group. The same goes for skipping 1 or 2 bridges. The DPS requirement is probably much lower, like around 250k DPS for skipping a single bridge. The hardest part is making sure everyone stays alive during the period. Thanks for watching, and if you found this video helpful, don't forget to give it a like and uh, consider subscribing to my channel.